to today's lecture. We are going to have a light, slight detour uh, on the over over next slide or something like that. Oh no, I don't bring it. Uh, just the point again that the, exos the exam will be on July 8th. June 3rd, I still don't know whether there will be a lecture. At this point, I doubt it. <coughs> And I thought that I put in the 2D, the slide 1D, 2D, 3D. Uh, I don't see it. Do I? No, it's really not in. Um, so if you do a 2D alignment, a 2D is still not a letter, right? Can you map, can you imagine any way by which you can map a three-dimensional coordinate structure onto a string? Secondary structure is the answer and is an answer, but what that slide says is secondary structure is not really containing all the information. Could you imagine a way in which you sort of sneak in some 2D representation in a 1D formulation? So I want to convert from 2D to 1D or from 3D to 1D? So that you apply dynamic programming, yes. Can you imagine a way in doing that? I mean, you can, you can write, write um, um, the amino acid and the next week write the, the predicted 2D structure. So. 2D structure, what do you mean? The contacts? The timing and then... Contacts, all the others. No, 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 no but that is again, we, we, we are going to get, in the end of, the, of today, we're going to get to secondary structure. I'm talking about something that has more information of the structure than secondary structure. Isn't there something like these fingerprints of... That's a good idea, and that's a good idea. So essentially... They are one, one but they are not... Typically, really, they are sequence signals. Really Most of the time, they are yeah. sequence signals. Most of the time, they don't contain 3D structure. They contain it implicitly because they exist, yeah. because something matches in 3D structure that is important for the function. So 3D structure is important for the function. The function motif is 1D, blah, blah, blah. And so you have a connection implicit. But I'm talking about an explicit connection. Can you imagine to put a structure? So what I'm fishing for, and maybe I haven't introduced it well enough. Maybe if it's on the inside or the outside. So, that again is a, is a great point and you, you're bringing the last slides uh, into the front of our t talk today. But that still is a feature on strictly speaking 1D. There is something more that you can predict. So what you could do, have you heard about the chi-square, uh, the chi, the, um, uh, the, the angle, the, 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 so the, the hydral angles, exactly, thank you. Uh, so you, you see, you could describe the protein, not in terms of 3D coordinates, but for every single residue you could look at the, the, the angles it has to the next one, right? And then you can define for every single residue the space, the position, the coordinates of it in the 2D plot of the dihedral angles, and then you essentially can assign classes in these dihedral ang angles and can have a new alphabet that in fact has points in this distribution of the dihedral angles, right? That is more than secondary structure, it's less than contacts, it's not 3D structure, but it's, it has the potential to capture more than secondary structure. Uh, in fact, again, something like that has been tried, and we, we are going to get back. Yeah. You are smiling. I'd like yes, to know why. Uh, we, we tried that. Um, we had this, this uh, practical in our bachelor, so the Kobe. Uh -huh. And um, we did try to, um, to make that work um, um, along with other things. And it didn't. So maybe we just did something wrong. But um, Okay, it was a great idea. So, so it fails. Uh, so since it didn't work for you, it must fail for everybody. Yes. Um, right. Profile-based alignments. So the first method, you all know, psi blast. The idea simply is you have built up this profile. Once you know the profile, and this is an SH3 family for your information, three, four columns entirely conserved. So this conservation tells you where to align, how to align the next one. And the way to do that simply is use some sort of generic scoring matrix here, the Blossom 62, and align that into that profile. Okay. The background idea, again, Stephen Altschul, David Lippmann, uh, Tom Madden, Alejandro Schaefer, Webb Miller, Psyblast, 97. Uh, the main point, the person behind is Stephen Altschul. Stephen Altschul did a master in Harvard mathematics, went into computational biology to do his PhD at Harvard, MIT. Uh, so his background really is in mathematics, statistics, biology, 
has 70 publications, which is not that high, and Age Index 44, which is not that high, but over 120,000 citations, because at this point, BLAST is the most quoted alignment method in, in the world has overtaken Cluster, which is the second one I'll talk about. The other person on that, David Lipman, uh, MD, in, uh, MD and Master in Brown, MD in uh, Buffalo, you know, New York, uh, age index of 47, 71 publications. Again, not so exciting, but when you look, and this is the old numbers, so it's the same papers that uh, Stephen Altschul is on, over 100,000 citations. This is an incredible performance. Plus, he actually, in his private job, sort of speak, is the director of the NCBI and has been, did, been the director since 89. Uh, giant in the field. So the concept of Cyblast is the old story, uh, fast hashing. You do this by the quick word matching kind of word is not exactly uh, the, the, the words as you know because words is done by fast A. Instead fast a blast defines a neighborhood where neighborhood in fact words uh, yes and yes ma matches uh, but yes and yeah and yes and yen match too because it's essentially look up of this value here in the blossom matrix if the value is be above some number it's defined as a neighborhood and that is sort of the extension of blast other than that essentially the 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 same as before, then you do a dynamic programming to extend the regions in between. That is fast because the regions in between are so small. Important is to get the statistics right. I mentioned that before, uh, increasingly, Blast is getting increasingly good, better at this. You collect all the pairs, so essentially you do that, all I said, one against the database, collect all the pairs, build the profile, and then use that profile to align the next one into it. Uh, now, what's the next step? <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> yes, so position specific means you look into a profile, iteration is what the I stands for. Uh, you take then this profile, search the entire sequence with that profile. So you want to now match into the profile. In particular, you would, for instance, sort of uh, f f want to match the conserved residues in this one here. Um, now, expanding in sequence space in some sense, let me just illustrate the way Psyblas operate. You begin in the first iteration with the sequence U. The green here is my idea of a family. It could be all the things that have a similar structure, all the things that are evolutionary related, all the things that have a similar function. In my first iteration, what geometric environment will I find? Where am I looking exactly? I will find a circle because I will find everything that is at a certain cutoff of E value, whatever I consider the safe distance, maybe 10 minus 3, 10, maybe 10 minus 6, wherever I put it, it is always a circle around the center point U. Okay? Now assume in my particular uh, search I found these sequences and now in fact I build a profile. Well, that means that this profile sort of puts the focus, the lens with which I look into my eye, into my iteration, to my next step, is this one. Which in fact in terms of surface is larger than the circle. But you immediately observe something here, namely there's something that is no longer seen in this wider space. So my second iteration, I'm doing better than in my first, yet something that was a trivial relation in the pairwise blast is no longer visible simply because coincidentally the sequences I find represent more this part. It could be because the distribution of this island is not unique. It could be because there are many many sequences on this side that we haven't seen yet. Either of those two. It is moving. Now of course if I or it could be that in fact they had 500 sequences here and only one or two or three here. So still the profile would sort of go in that direction. But of course, if I had found some, then in the end in the blast they would also be reported, right? No, that's not true. So you have to watch out. When you go to the bottom of the Psi blast, your best hit, your best search at the end of the file list will only give you the last iteration. 
things that were safe and correct before and that dropped will not be visible. So you have to retrieve them in your Psy Blast profile. Okay? That's an important reality for every single Psy Blast. The final thing is not the summary of it all. The final step is what the final step gives. And there's a, there's a, there are many good reasons to be said for that. Uh, but that is something that you have to watch out for because it happens in essentially every run that is a little bit more, brings in a little bit more diversions. Okay? Now, again, you lose something that is safe. Uh, you are willing to pay for that because you get increasingly large. Uh, there is now something else that you're missing. Remember we talked about the, iter uh, the intermediate sequence story. So the intermediate sequence was an example where I had family, uh, oh, sorry, so A in the center here, B at the center here, they are both not within reach for the safe zone. But I have an intermediate sequence X that is in the safe zone of both of them. So I can infer that X, that a and, uh, X have the same, A and B have the same, uh, X and B have the same, so A and B have the same. Now, the same kind of story I could apply for everything I find here in the first hit. So these sort of bluish circles around all of these. They would be larger than my Psi Blast profile lens. Why don't I do that? Um, I think I remember there was a problem with this because if you have, for example, one long protein and then protein A just covers one half and protein C covers the other half and then they are not really um, the same, they're just aligned to both aligned to the same. So this could be A, X, B. Uh, that would be an example, so somehow the domain problem. That is one problem, and that is a crucial problem because we don't have all the domains labeled. But say I could fix that. Say I could have a good a subset of things for which I know the domains, and that constitutes my new database. Why don't I do that? Because similarity is not so... Um, if, if A and X are, um, have a similarity score of farm and X and B have a similarity score of farm, but still doesn't mean it's the same kind of similarity. So it could be similarity to, to, to one direction and then on the other side to the other. You have to help me out a little bit. So again, let me, let me repeat. We don't have, we, so I, I'm looking at cases where the similarity between A and X is in the same region and between B and X is in the same region. So now, what, what is, why is similarity of A to X not the same as the similarity of X to B? Say, uh, so they would be within the 10 minus 3 to each other, and they would be in the 10 minus 3 to each other. So why is that not the same? Um, what do you mean? Let's, let's say that... Um, I also don't. <laughs> so I, do, I really don't get your idea. I'm not saying that is wrong. I, I just don't understand what you. Before you know how to phrase it, I don't know what you want to say. Yeah. It's often like that in life. Tough. That was really unfair. I'll I'll, um, I'll raise my hand again to figure it out. Um, anybody else? So why don't we do that? Well, uh, A and B could be within 10 to minus 3 and 10 to minus 6. And since we have an uh, EYA cut off, we uh, have adjusted for that. So yeah, no, no, but my, so b b whatever your e e value cutoff was, uh, my model, my, my example is built such that they fall within that cutoff. Both. Both pairs. Which means since X is an intermediate, B and A are not reachable by the safe cutoff, right? They're only reachable through this intermediate, which essentially is the situation that I'm illustrating here with these light blue circles. You, but this will happen adjusted for um, where the majority of, of heads is. That is true, but if you look at the egg-shaped thing here, that I mean, and these circles, they are not identical. 
Well, it's trying to build family, so. This is true. So ultimately, you, you, you say if I had a coverage of the entire island, if I sampled it right, then ultimately we would hope that maybe these two things would converge. They may or may not. My question here is, in the first step, I could in fact do both. I could, here's what I could do. I could, in fact, instead of using the egg in my second step, build all these circles and build a hyper egg for my second step. Because that egg that would then come from, from all the things I find with the circles, Again, again, you're totally right. The domain problem is a, is a problem here. But if I could solve that, uh, then the next round egg would be bigger. Yeah, but That's a faster way to, to, to get at a wider view, no? Yeah, but since the following steps are um, using, uh, accounting for all uh, hits in the areas, if you take false positives into the... That, we get into that. That's a very, very good point. But so again, in my example, they are not false positives. Okay. As long as I, again, on the, on the, as long as we don't have the domain issue, I told you that this intermediate sequence search remains almost at 100% accuracy throughout for very divergent A and Bs. So I'm not likely, as long as I manage the domain problem, and as long as X and A and X and B are close enough to each other, I could avoid, I could hopefully avoid somehow pollution, right? So pollution is not the issue. It's the only issue really is time. Because essentially, so far what we did is one pairwise blast that gave us the view of this egg. Now running with the egg against the database is another pairwise blast. In this particular case here, would be five more pairwise blasts. So what seems to be a, a speed way to getting to something a little bit larger than this circle is actually slowing it down. It would take five times as much as... Uh, still, you may get something that you do not get with the egg. And that is why some people, in fact, for the prediction of protein structure for in the CASP competition, do exactly that. It's just not available as a service for anybody out there, but many people who predict structures have done, have implemented this concept. Um, now, you totally foresaw the, the big issue. The big issue is the moment my lens becomes somehow so large that I in fact get the wrong one. Then I'm, then I'm, 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 I'm in trouble. Why am I suddenly in trouble? The point is that what this profile builds up is to know where the conservation is. And it puts increasing weight on this conservation. The moment I get anything wrong, that is the killer of exactly that profile. Most likely the wrong one is going to violate crucial positions and get the signal in totally the wrong connection. In this case, you see that all you need to do is one alignment that does not conserve those four. And you're already, at least you're down from, from, from four to three. Right? That's why this pollution is dangerous. And that does, however, happen um, all the time in most last runs. How could you avoid that pollution? Ideas? Yeah? You could limit your rounds. <laughs> uh, that is true what you say, but then you also, I mean, in some sense, what, what you argue for now is if I only do, let me just paraphrase you and, and, and just be a little bit more aggressive. As long as I only do pairwise alignments, I'm safer. That's true, but the, the, the nice, nice fruits are hanging high. And that means profile-based alignments. So I could, I could do profile-based as well, just not indefinitely. I mean, I did not say indefinitely. I'm, I'm trying How do you know where to stop? Between is the number two or is it the number three or is it the number four? How far do you go? Every time you find something, how far do you go? It's true. If you, the, the earlier you stop, the less likely you hit the pollution. But again, you're trying to get into something that you cannot reach by pairwise comparisons. So you want to go further. You want to make this lens larger. 
early stop is a hack. It has been done for many, by many people for, for many years. In fact, in the first, um, first when 97, when Psylas was published, almost every search produced some pollution. So then we all sort of did, did an early stop. Simply, that's a hack. Is there anything better than a hack? So meanwhile, Psyblast got much better. Uh, but yeah? Maybe we could um, enforce some um, very strict standard after like the first three or four iterations would say, so the, the positions that are conserved right now <laughs> but that's the, that's the same thing. You're, 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 going, you're, going, you're treading in a circle. You essentially say that, okay, as long as, as I recognize some important features in my profile, I at some point say, now I know those are the four important residues. How do you know what that point is when you say now the four? The first iteration, the second iteration. So there, there is no clear... Yeah, but you could um, assign a higher weight to profiles found in the first iterations, like the earlier yeah. found, the more important it is. The tendency, important. however, mm -hmm. you're right, but it's somehow you're going in the same direction. Same direction so you, you're sort of saying, let's not move too far. But in moving too far, sorry, not too far, in moving far is the entire bounty. <laughs> That's what I want to get. That's the treasure, right? That's the one I'm hunting for. So you're right, but you're being too careful here. No, I want something that is more specific safeguard. Good? No. I thought that if, uh, if the sequence is wrong, it would not match the, the profile. Because ah, that's the problem. So it may just, let's get back to the, uh, to the profile, it may just be the three residues are the same and not the fourth. Uh, it may just be that there's something else where it has a high propensity. So the definition of uh, pollution is, yes, the sequence, the wrong sequence matches the profile from the family X. Maybe if I have candidate, but I'm not sure, then I start, start with this candidate and try to search from there. Okay. That's a great idea. So do it both directions. So. Uh, let, let, me, let me just illustrate that idea in, with another idea that some people uh, go for. And again, we, we have tried all of these things uh, and somehow people have put hacks into their programs. So one could be an explosion. So suddenly there is a new run between i and i plus one and you suddenly explode in the number of sequences you find. That was another first moment uh, safeguard that we put in. The trouble is, very often, we have fa parts in this family here that is highly densely populated, and you reach only in, in, in run i, and suddenly you get an i, uh, run i plus one, you get into a new treasure area. And it's a real treasure, and it explodes your number. But this would be one way. So we explode, the moment we explode, we look at the things that came in from the explosion, and with, we start the search with these things. The other way around and see whether we find that. That again, so the bidirectional psi blast is in fact another safeguard. So we have two things here. We have a sudden explosion, we have a bidirectional search with things that are somehow suggested of putative pollution points. Anything else? people did is they uh, randomized sequences, put them in and see whether they found them. People put the sequences the other direction in and they found them. People put things in and that is sort of related uh, to something that I will show later. So say we're starting our search with an old alpha. The moment I find, find an old beta protein, I, I have an alarm. It's sort of similar to, to what you say. Uh, but those, yeah? It's not already too far if I find an old beta protein. It's like everything else has failed, now even all betas are in the search. No, but that's one way. So my, my issue here is what I'm trying to address is how can I define the point of what is too far? Uh, and clearly, yes, that is the moment when you would begin to say, oops, that is too far. But in a search where you find thousands of hits, what, how do you decide what the point of too far is? 
uh, again, uh, in, in the good olden days where you had 10 or 20, you could look at them, could Google them all. Today, you may find really thousands. And it will not possibly be that easy. That would be a simple way, and people again do that. So inverted sequences, uh, randomized sequences, uh, different secondary structure, again, those are extreme ways, and you're right. But those are safeguards that people will somehow put in. Okay, let's get back to this is fast and dirty, most used alignment method, cluster, the series of clusters. That is dynamic programming, which we know is guaranteed as long as you know what is optimal, guaranteed to find a better solution than Psyblast. Now we have one issue here. Psyblast, mind you, is taken, you search for the sequence against the database. Cluster is not. In cluster, what you do is you let somebody run a Psyblast and you just look at some set of all the Psyblast results that are in fact unpolluted. So you assume that somebody gives you a family of proteins that are related and you don't care about e-values or anything like that. You just align the best you can whatever you find. Cluster. It started with cluster V, W, X, Omega. And Omega is as you know, the last letter in the alphabet, uh, and on the Omega, Cluster Omega website, it, it simply says that is the only alignment program you will ever uh, need in your life. Um, Des Higgins is behind Cluster V, Des Higgins is behind these series of programs. The idea really is it's a multiple alignment in the sense that there is no sequence in this alignment that has any priority. They are all aligned such that they form the best view of the entire family. So that's philosophy statement number one. Statement number two is about dynamic programming, pairwise. I talk, we talked about it briefly. Uh, you begin by building a phylogenetic tree. And the phylogenetic tree, again, you take, sorry, first pairwise alignments, and then you build a phylogenetic tree. The point, and I'm going to go through these here, the point is that we in fact do not know the history of all the proteins, so essentially what we today assume as a phylogenetic tree may not be the historical truth, simply because we don't have all the trace record. That's a problem. But Cluster assumes a tree. Let's begin with a tree. Now, once it assumes that the, the, the tree is there, uh, which is built from these uh, pairwise relationships, you can, in fact, impose an order and begin to pairwise align. Again, in the Rust Doodle idea, so you begin with the most similar ones. Now, the great intelligence of Cluster goes into how this is done. So you can look up a lot of the details about A and B their composition, amino acid composition, their relation, sequence identity between each other. And according to what you see, you can adjust the gap penalties and the, the substitution matrix that you take. So every pair alignment in Cluster is using different parameters, or maybe using different parameters. That's the great aspect of Cluster. That, in fact, is the aspect why it, it becomes so, so accurate. The cluster omega, as this one says here, number of sequences in families, uh, time taken. Uh, cluster omega is the, the, the red one here. The, those are K-align, muscle, MAFT. Those are other alignment programs that use dynamic programming. And the point is that overall cluster strikes a very good balance between speed and uh, speed here and number of sequences that it can align and in fact accuracy. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, so K align appears to be a little bit better, but I do not have the comparison of, of accuracy. So K align is not as accurate uh, in that sense. So K line is fast, but Clustal is, is, is better. And of the things that, that are better than Clustal, Clustal is the fastest. And somehow, therefore, the argument is this is a good balance. Uh, Clustal also does iterations uh, and improves slightly over the iterations. The history of Clustal in terms of citations over 100,000. Uh, Clustal, uh, the origin of these papers, so the latest one is not quoted as much. 
because it always takes a while and the papers are quoted. People behind it are th three. Uh, let's begin with Des Higgins, now in Dublin. Uh, he did this work in Heidelberg initially at the MBL, went on to the EBI in Hingston, Cambridgeshire. Where this may be taken, I'm not sure. Uh, this, I believe, is in Ireland. Um, 94 publications, two uh, over 30,000, age index 52, really influenced science. Toby Gibson, we talked about why we need alignment methods. Computers do things faster. Some people do it better visually. Toby is one of those people. Uh, he aligns sequences on the same papers, similar track record, is not at the MBL. Judy uh, is the third in the team. And the point that I want to make here is Des is the one who does the algorithm. Toby is the one who does the visual alignment. Judy does the visual interface. So essentially what Des did is change clusters such that it would reproduce the alignments that Toby saw. Toby can see his alignments better because Judy gives him nice colors. This way he can really align a thousand and more sequences. He does that on the screen. Uh, but he needs her images for that. And then he, Des makes the, the, the method work in a way that Toby is happy. This is a triumvirate. This is incredibly powerful. And I believe this, ultimately, all three aspects are exactly what makes Castle so incredibly successful. Um, what he, what the reason why I bring this up, by all means, try to be one of, of those. So, I don't know how many alignment tools have been published. A thousand, maybe? Uh, this is along with Psyblast, one of the most successful ones. And I believe, in contrast to Psyblast, here the reason, the reason really is that everything fits well. Find a way to be one of those three in a thousand, or uh, whatever the, the number is. There's absolutely no reason why you cannot achieve that. They've done it. There's nothing special with them. Uh, you can do it too. And I mean it. It's just you have to don't let go. Don't, don't, don't settle for anything that is less than the best you can do. Uh, sort out how to best do it. In this particular case, it was a little bit about luck to come together, but it's also about using the luck. Maxom. Uh, Maxom, those are the most often used, second most often used. And again, I would argue that Castle is used so often because ultimately it allows people to put a figure in the paper. And that's what they quote. They all use Psyblast, but very often the paper will only quote Clustal. They run a Psyblast first, they don't quote that, they run the Clustal then and put the picture into the, in, into the paper, and then they will quote it. At least one in three will quote the Clustal. Uh, most people don't quote. Don't forget what these methods are for your smiling. Uh, experimental biologists. Experimental biologists are used to kids. Kits they buy. So they go to some producer of, a, of an experimental toolkit, they pay for that, and they put the name of that toolkit into their methods section. And thus, in the same way, they call it Clustal, and they believe that you're happy. So they don't pay you for that if you're the Clustal developer. So, in some sense, we, computational biologists, are paid for by getting citations. But for experimental biologists, often, you know, that. That is something else, and the, the important or the fact that computational tools are different from kits delivered by companies is still not clear. That's why, in fact, most papers don't quote uh, the tools they, they use. Um, Maxom. Maxom is no longer really used uh, by a lot of people. It uses a slow dynamic programming and somehow is similar to Clustal. But the difference in the people who, uh, who it comes from is Chris Sander, uh, now at Sloan Kettering, Reinhard Schneider, who is now at Luxembourg University. They did that at EMBL. The important in principle, this looks like the figures before for Clustal. And that was done in the same space, in the same building, um, one on a floor higher. Des was sitting on a floor higher above Reinhard. Um, but the important issue between Clustal and Maxom is 
cluster is family centric. It tries everything such that the whole family, everybody in the family is treated equally. While Maxim argues, and as a search, there are other programs I'll get back to later, says you begin with one sequence and that sequence is special. Everything here should be enslaved to that sequence. In particular, you don't want insertions in that sequence. You want to learn whatever you can about the sequence that you want to work on. Your sequence shouldn't have an insertion. You want to know what this residue is next to, what this residue does. Okay? So that's a different view. And you may argue which view is better. When you want to predict structure, when you want to use the alignment to predict structure or function, this is clearly the view that you care for. Your protein doesn't have insertions. Your protein has a sequence and that's the way it is. Um, but this view has more tools to it and it somehow has become the more dominant one. By the way, Psyblast somehow has a view more similar to that. So let's get into hidden Markov models. And hidden Markov models, so I'm through half of my slides. Uh, and the, the way I get through the other half as quickly is by, in fact, very, very, very fast forwarding in hidden Markov models. Um, hidden Markov models, the algorithms to use to explain hidden Markov models are highly non-trivial. It's the kind of thing, if you want to really be able to program them, it may take a semester. The baum welch algorithm in, in, in particular too, is not that trivial. Uh, it's in some sense uh, uh, dynamic programming again and again in a clever way. But to make it happen, to put it into the program, it's not that trivial. And that's not the kind of thing you can do in... I, I guess this is the better part of an ent entire lecture that would go for that. Um, and I still don't have a good way to find a fast track so here are the most important alignment methods. Let's move on to comparative modeling on Thursday and giving you some ideas. So I give you some history. And the history uh, starts with Anash Koch. Uh, Anash Koch is uh, somebody who lives in a country that is very warm, Copenhagen. Uh, so the highest temperature in summer is 21 degrees. Uh, the, the Copenhagen on the train station, there's the max over the last 100, 100 years. It's 21 degrees or 22 or something like that. It's really true. Uh, or maybe it was 27, but some, some incredibly low number. So it's even colder than here. Uh, and you know, he has this, this idea that ocean is good and, and that warm weather is good. So he goes to California. In California, he finds David Hausler, who's a physicist. David Hausler is open to any great idea. Uh, Anash had introduced a book, had written a book on neural networks that was really a mind changer in, in the 80s. And somehow after that, that was completely independent of biology, just neural networks in terms of what they mean for physics. Um, and he went on from neural networks into hidden Markov models and felt that hidden Markov models would be great for biology. And David Hausler's group was open for that. Actually, David Hausler had not worked on alignments at all, had not worked on, on real biology problems at all. Uh, Kevin Karplus was a statistician in, in this area, and again, he had not worked on that. Uh, so Anash came and wanted to have a good time in, in, in a nice sunny California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and David was open for anything, and you know, Kevin was the one to do the work. Uh, then Anash went on to go back to Europe because of family reasons, where he hit on Richard Durbin, Sean Eddy, uh, and got sort of the European side of hidden Markov models that actually now comes as hammer from the US. Uh, the tool that came out of that is SAM here, um, that still comes out from the US, but most people now use hammer. Uh, so the idea simply is, you have a sequence and a model of hidden states that define the probabilities of going into an insertion state, insertion deletion state, or into an alignment state. And if in an alignment state, which residue are you in an aligned to? You build up these probability profiles for a set for one particular family. So you build one profile, one 
hidden Markov model for a family. Important in the hidden Markov model is that all you know at uh, state i is only influenced by what you had at the state i minus 1. Which again, all alignment me methods assume independence, blast, uh, dynamic programming, whatever we presented so far, assume strictly independence between i and i and j. Uh, <coughs> so it's a similar idea. Or well, not that different here, we have one uh, back. Uh, the slides that I show, that I run through, are uh, from Kevin Kaplos, uh, here on his favorite bike. Uh, and that he presented in Heidelberg in 99. You start with a single sequence. You build a model from the sequence. How do you do that? Well, first you look at the probability of observing certain states. The probability you want uh, microstates in the system, probability of observing a particular amino acid A. Uh, it is minimal for a peak distribution here, as maximal for a uh, uh, uniform distribution, maximal entropy. So now let's start with the first sequence. Before you align anything into it, what's your first model? Your first level model. How are you going to have the probabilities before you start? So you're going to bring sequences in and learn the family. But before you have the first one, I mean the second one, so you start with the, f the first. What's your null model, so to speak? Wouldn't it be that uh, the first probability probability for the first amino acid is x. Uh, that, in fact, is a, an issue. I don't know why there is an x. Okay, so but the probability... probability yeah, it could be. That is a frequent... That could be the right answer. I don't know whether it's a eukaryotic protein. CRD, we would have to look it up. Okay, so but the probabilities for each of these amino acids occurring after the one before them is always one. The so they're all equal. No, but uh, the model, if you put anything in it, it will just always give you this sequence for the first. Then that is, that is a solution. Right. Because it's true. The, the, the prior is itself. Right. Is that the best prior? Not really, because you disregard everything else. Sometimes that can be good. But I, think, I thought there was nothing. So I, I wonder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's, for that family, there's nothing else at this point. But what he, I, I attacked his logic. So so far, he hasn't said anything. Hey, we, you, you should at least take some pseudo count. Ah, what is a pseudo count? Um, you're pretending you've seen other stuff too. How can you make that reality instead of pretending? Yeah. Use the natural distribution. Yeah. What, what do you mean by natural? The observed. What uh, do you mean by observed? Well, we have an average for, for each amino acid, how often it occurs Where? in a natural state. Where? Uh, yeah, you can, you can adjust it for, for human or for. That's my question species. to you. Would we take human? Would we take other species? Say, <laughs> let's assume that is a selenocysteine, and say this is a human protein. Would you take human? We could, we could use a weighted average or whatever of, of all vertebrates or whatever we need. That is my question to you. What is it that you need? So you're the programmer. Well, it, it depends if, we, if we're looking for a family in all vertebrates, we, we can use... But what are we? So let's get back, back trace. What do we try to do? We try in this in this lecture. We really try to define anything that sort of defines a family of similar structures. So the next issue will be comparative modeling. We want to find things that we hope have a similar structure. So keep that in mind. So what do you want to do here? Yeah, we don't just want to look only in humans, but also find related. This is vertebrates. It's not human only. No. Uh, yeah. Okay, vertebrates, but that's not even all, I would say. More than vertebrates. Yeah. There aren't flies into the game. All eukaryotes, maybe? All eukaryotes. Yeast. Uh, I don't know. So where do we stop? Do we take everything now? Do we take Uniprot or...? We take all uh, proteins that have to say... Because we're trying to infer a structure, right? So we'll take all the proteins which fold in the same, ah. the same circumstances. And I'm not entirely sure 
they do the same in Brooklyn? It's an interesting idea. And there, so here's the problem with that idea. You're beginning to be a little bit circular. But it is true that we, we typically train the hidden Markov model on a known family, and that could be a family that I checked by a psi blast and I believe has a similar structure. So we could take that family. That is, in fact, one solution. I believe you, you now have, said, you have given us two valid solutions. One is identity. Uh, one is, so e uh, I throw in, is, is, is equally simple. Uh, one in 20, ameliorated or slightly changed by somehow that there is a certain letter that you already have. Um, so, and then the, the idea of using that family, and I believe evolved from this before, was Uniprot. In some sense, I say Uniprot, because again, the Psi Blast, remember, you guys were too careful in how can we avoid pollution. But in principle, we want to have as much diversity as possible. As long as I do it without polluting, the more diversity I bring in, so everyone who brings in a new change to kill, if the conserved residue is not important for that structure, then I want the one that shows me that, in fact, there is something else. So any diversity that gets me out of something that is valid only because evolution didn't have enough time helps me. That's why I say not only eukaryotes, but really the entire uniprot in this particular context of trying to do comparative modeling. So the background probability. Uh, the, again, so after we have the alignment, now we have the alignment. Uh, we have a posterior probability, and the posterior probability uh, is essentially what we had the prior uh, plus what we, what we have observed. And now assume that we have a position that is conserved, this high, if a position uh, is, sorry, is, 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 um, is conserved, it is actually the, is zero, the information content. Uh, if it is completely varied, is some fixed constant. And what I show here is somehow the bit saved is the alignment, is the value, the difference between the two. And that gives you an idea about essentially the height of the letters proportional to the, the bits saved by that letter at that particular position. And you immediately can, in some sense, read off a profile. If you think about it, this is like a profile before or put it differently, you take the profile and put that into the system as probability. Uh, now, in case where you have few members, the background probability dominates. In case where you have many, the profile dominates. There's the problem of possible overtraining. In particular, in cases where you don't have enough points. So let's just assume you have an example where you have, in fact start your alignment with a long protein and you find a lot of two domain proteins that are sort of here, the middle region will be looking as if it is entirely conserved, only because you don't find anything else. Uh, or whatever you find is too close. And that is the kind of overtraining that you can do. But still, you, you build up this profile and you go into the same kind of iteration and refine the hidden Markov model. There are some issues, but there are pseudocounts they are, they are trivially to solve. So much about hidden Markov models. So there's a whole generation of people working on hidden Markov models. Hidden Markov models, clearly, those are the most used methods there, Psi Blast and Classful. Uh, this is important for the philosophy. The next one is Hammer. That is used for PFAM, underneath PFAM. So that may ultimately take over in terms of the most used program. Here comes something totally different, tea coffee. This is a genetic algorithm. Uh, it comes from Cedric Notre Dame, Jaap Heringer, who's at Amsterdam, uh, and S. Higgins. And that is where Cedric sits. So hidden Markov model, I went through it very quickly. That's another place where you could have a good time in Barcelona, CRG in Barcelona. And in fact, that is made from the Institute, this photo. So, uh, and that is in fact the, the downtown, it's just a little bit further of Barcelona. So you could study there. Right? Or you could um, be friend, become friends with Cedric, is my advice. Um, so you begin with a library of local and global pairwise alignments here, uh, and put them into this grinder, the coffee grinder. Now, the coffee grinder is going to do the genetic algorithm. So it's going to simply do the repairing. 
the repairing allows you to get from the regular alignment to something that in fact reflects reality better because you can randomly regroup local regions. The great aspect of genetic algorithm is it allows you whatever you put in there could helpfully direct the system in the right direction. That means it's an easy way in fact to put specialist information in to put structural information in, to put information into the system that is completely violating the idea that I and J is in, are independent from each other. You could put contact information in, you could put any kinds of constraints into the system that you bring into the library. It may not survive because the genetic algorithm will just grind it up and randomly pair again. But according to its objective function, these things, if you put them in right, may still get through. That's the great aspect. So the genetic algorithm can do something that all the others cannot do. Okay? And it's getting better the more information you start with. Well, that is actually also true for the HMM. So you also need to start with a good model, to, a good family to start to get a good model. But still, the, the, this one can use information on a level that the others cannot. Draw downside. It's twofold. It may not use the information because ultimately its genetic optimization depends on some objective function. And if that objective function doesn't use structural information, it's at the end of the day probability that it survives, gets through, that means, down here. Uh, and the other problem is, well, uh, problem or not problem, is uh, it eats up a lot of CPU, very slow. But still, Tussle at Tea Coffee by now has become one of the important other methods out there that has become a clear competitor of Tussle. Uh, and in fact, initially was only developed to show that you can also do something as good as Tussle with genetic algorithm. And initially, really, the idea was to show genetic algorithm because it's fun to work on genetic algorithm and it could work. So that's why Cedric began to do that. Uh, but now it's a serious contender that in fact can do something that nobody else can do. Here, SS search, PSY search are methods. PSY search is from uh, Bill Pearson, so the fast A, who, the one who brought us fast A. This is just a very fast in between dynamic programming and heuristic. SS search is fully dynamic programming, like Maxom has a, a t top priority for the first sequence. Um, uh, it's faster than Clustal, uh, but other than that, they, they are not bringing anything new. Many people use SS Search simply because it's a very easy to use program that has dynamic programming and is very accurate. But then Clustal W is better, as long as you have enough CPU. Anything more fancy that you can think about? Yeah? Graph state. Great idea. So no, sorry, 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 I should have. Um, yeah, I, I should have restricted your search space with my question. So, you're totally right. Uh, again, I said there are a thousand publications on alignments. Most likely this is a strong underestimate. Uh, there are certainly over a thousand over the last decade. Uh, I believe every book, every method that you can imagine has been tried to predict secondary structure and every method has been tried to do alignments. So. Graph search is one example, and I, in fact, I don't, I cannot quote it now. But I've seen a paper. No, what I meant is something else. Uh, it's pairwise alignment essentially does sequence sequence, right? All you know when you compare these two sequences, something about the database maybe that's how you get the uh, blossom matrix, and then other than that, you only look at the pair. Okay. The next iteration is we did a sequence profile, and that allows me to find relations that I cannot find by sequence sequence. I've shown you some of the problems with that. Now, what else can we do? Profile profile. Yeah. Sure, sorry. I have to do the, uh, this slide differently. Um, when I explain what I'm looking for, it's too easy. When I don't explain, it's impossible. Uh, so essentially, you compare these two profiles. How would you do that? Yeah. Yes, that you can do. 
But now my question is slightly different. So let's just assume we, we looked at these four entirely conserved columns. How would you establish their similarity? So dynamic programming leads an objective function. The ob sorry, the objective function could be amino acid identity. Now there's nothing like that here, right? So what do we take? Well, more or less there is. We have the probabilities for each amino acid and we can just compare them. How? <laughs> yeah. Can you write down the formula? <laughs> so, w w which which value would you compute? Probability. Yeah, yeah. So you have two probability vectors. Yeah, you have two vectors of twenty probabilities. And how would you estimate, how would you measure their similarity? What is the distance measure you can imagine? We could start with uh, with the Euclidean distance for for the beginning. It's okay. Like those. Yeah. Ah. That is where I'm trying to put my finger on. You could use the Euclidean distance, you could use the arithmetic distance, you could look at the, uh, the uh, dot product, you could look at the regular product. You can compute the distance between two vectors in very many different ways. Now you just make the next statement and look how it works out. The problem is, so when we looked at how can we assess pairwise alignments, we were in a, an area where we could still find experts who could tell us whether we are right or wrong. Profile profile alignment goes so far into the distance that we don't have easy, so before we didn't have easy access to, to experts. There are just a bunch of them in the world and everybody wants them. Uh, but now there, there's almost nobody left. Now we get into a realm where we, what you said before, we have sometimes motifs, functional motifs. They allow us to identify that this potassium channel in a bacterium may be the one most related to, to human because I have an intuition for the alignment. That's how uh, the potassium channel that got its Nobel Prize by, by identifying the one that worked uh, in, a, in, in a glorious way of finding a distant alignment. But most of the time you don't find that. So it's not that easy to establish the alternative solutions. That, in fact, is the problem underneath. There are too many free parameters. Then on top you have the gap open penalty, you have the, you said dynamic programming. In principle you could do the same with uh, the other methods that I showed, which is HMM uh, or the genetic algorithm. But still, you have a lot of free parameters. That, in fact, in some sense, has hampered the progress in the field um, for many years. By the way, here's another issue. What I mean to indicate here is, so we have eight sequences aligned. Here you have uh, an arginine muta mutating to a lysine, mutating to a tryptophan, DEV, and you see somehow this mutation here is correlated. By just compiling the vector, and that, in fact, in this particular case, is a meaningful correlation. It tells us something about uh, the way these two residues are connected in space. Their uh, contacts. And we, I will get at the end of the lecture back to this. Uh, but, of course, you throw this away. Right? So maybe the profile profile alignment, in fact, is not entirely what you want because it sort of gets rid of an important signal. And that certainly is also a problem. Uh, still, I, I would challenge that the major problem with profile profile alignment has been the technical complication. Let me give you a cheap hack toward profile profile. And that, thanks for the slides to Darius Trzebilski, who is now at the Broad Institute. I guess this is taken at the Broad Institute. So, Let's get back in terms of CPU quality. Profile sequence is somewhere here, so Psi Blast. Profile profile is somewhere here. Can we find something in between? Let's just say we give in. We say profile profile is too complicated. We have too many open parameters. We have, our data set is not big enough to, do, to establish that this is better than that. Um, so is there anything we can do in between? Well, that's what I'm doing is a zip pack as well, but we could make um, a consensus sequence of the fund profile and uh, compare it to the profile. How did you come to that? Well, um, there was a standard of consensus, but that's before. So oh! Yeah. That's why I said... Where did I say that? Oh! Yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I have to change that. 
Um, so I'm actually testing your awakeness. <laughs> that was meant to be like that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I hope I'll remember that. Um, so you you have the sequence. You have the profile here, and the profile you put in the in this particular case blossom uh, matrix, and then you look up uh, what you consider to be a consensus residue. So it's not only the identical residue, but it's sort of the probability uh, multiplied or matched by the, um, according to the uh, blossom matrix. And then you, in fact, in this particular case, have here the stark residues where you have some conservation. And then you simply go ahead and align this consensus motif. So this, oops, the start part here against the profile. That means you do essentially exactly what you did before. You do one run of Psi Blast. In fact, the way uh, Darius initially implemented this was in exactly by the Psi Blast program. All you need to do in this final run, you sort of re replace the sequence by its consensus sequence. And what this one shows ultimately is that you do gain a lot by doing that. You do much better. And in fact, here, is a more modern way of doing a profile profile, an entire profile profile alignment, HH Blitz, that comes from Munich, from the group of Johannes Söding, who is at the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen, but has been in Munich for most of the time of the development. It started in Tübingen uh, with Andre Lupas. The idea is you start with a query sequence, you find an HMM, you have some fast pre-filter of data sets of HMMs, uh, you go on uh, and you essentially align the pre-filtered set that is a million or a couple of million here against your HMM and you do essentially an HMM, HMM by doing something like the consensus idea. So the way they can speed it up is by using the same idea that in fact somehow they, they, the, the way they do it, they do it slightly differently from, from what Darius did. Darius really wrote out a sequence while they introduce a new alphabet. So with, with many states, and this is working much better than, than the simple consensus approach, and clearly is an almost complete profile profile, or at least in a, a very advanced uh, simplification to profile profile that works in real life very rapidly. Uh, you can do iterations with it, is what this one shows. That's the paper Nature Methods. It's a very, very interesting paper. Uh, and overall, this is where Hammer gets, this is where HH Blitz gets throughout really much better. You can identify things that are not identifiable by any other method. So it really works and very well when it works and is increasingly being used. In fact, in particular, to predict structure. So we, we want to identify evolutionary relations, we want to identify uh, structural relations, and let's just uh, go into pairwise profile sequence midnight. Let's get back into the midnight zone. Uh, I assume I, I could cut this. Uh, midnight zone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the products of known structure and compare them by 3D to each other. Or take some sequence unique subset, compare that to all. And then I'm going to plot how often do I find structures at a certain level of percentage sequence identity. So it will actually look something like this. So you, you will have 100% identical to zero identical, and then the distribution, and there's some curve that I will find. It may look like this, it may look like this, and that's sort of the random background, right? The random background simply, you have 120 residues, 100%, so 20 by 5, 100 by 20 is 5. Uh, so that's the random distribution, roughly, okay? That's what I observe. Uh, a little bit more here, because there's a lot of bias in the database. Uh, and somehow here, just below the twilight zone, that somehow the onset of the twilight zone is in this realm. Here, I f have my findings, right? And everybody's happy with that, right? Anybody's not? And by the way, the random is somewhere here. 
is one of those stories. I've been running around for many years and showed experts in the world and they were always happy with it. Um, it's absolutely wrong. It's not the truth at all. The truth is this. The red one is random. The black one is the data. So mind you, this is 25. So let me, before I have to rearrange my slides, uh, but this is the large one and there is this bar here means that the statistics, the way this is done is different from the statistics here and the result is that these numbers should actually be lower. So whatever, if I would correct for the mistake, if I could, then this would be invisible. Uh, the main message is that the absolute bulk of the distribution sits here, again that's the real data now, uh, from 97 or whatever that year, 97. Uh, let's get back to, whoops, sorry. Uh, let's get back to this point here. The two main features are the random distribution is round about five. It's not exactly five because the sequences that we observe in, in, in the database are not really random sequences. There are relations, pair relations. I and J relate to each other and that's exactly what the difference here between five and 5.8 implies. In fact, it's a big difference for a huge data set. Uh, that's where my observation is, just, you know, round about 10. This implies that in between you have something like five percentage points, ballpark, okay? Uh, this difference, if the black would be here, all faults would be alike. There must be a difference. The question is, how big is it? Now we have five, five percentage points. So five percentage points, I would argue, this is very close to the number of residues that every party needs to be functional. Maybe what I see here is not even structural. Maybe most of that difference, in fact, is something else. So that means that the proximity of the two is incredible. Most likely that means that evolution has reached some sort of saturation. Proteins have evolved as much as they could, or diverged as much as they could, most likely. It also means we have a problem with the, with the convergent evolution story. So if we now, usually convergent evolution means we have functional evolution to the same function. Uh, convergent means from zero, so two things that are completely unrelated. Divergent means two things are related and then they diverge. So what I see today is a result of a common ancestor, while convergent means is a result of unrelated things, right? But if what I see in terms of structure, conversion to the same structure is what I use now, if that is my PDB view, and that's my random view, I can absolutely from the mirror number here not distinguish divergent and conversion anymore. So a lot of people in the field assume that simply by the closer they are, the more likely it's divergent. But if most things are so dissimilar in terms of their sequence, there's no signal. And that is reality. So the vast majority of all the proteins that are similar in 3D have no sequence similarity. That's the midnight zone. Again, that midnight zone is something that I very much like to get into by sequence alignment methods. But even profile profile have a tough time. They sometimes intrude into that. But most of these relations I will not get. Some of those are the jewels that profile profile pick out. Secondary structure. And you all have said it before, secondary structure has regularities uh, and these regularities in fact may be used to align proteins. Then there is another way of uh, the, the 1D structure that's buried, exposed. Now I can in fact look at an alphabet that has secondary structures, three secondary structure states, helix, strand, other, two solvent accessibility state buried, exposed. Uh, in this letter alphabet, I can simply look at uh, percentage sequence identity and percentage identity of this 1D state. Okay? Now, this one here is, I look at two structures for which I know they are 3D related. That's what I see. So, in fact, that signal drops. I said that most 
proteins in the midnight zone have a similar structure. Why is it that this red one drops? Well, you can recognize the similarity of the fold, but many things in fact move around. And when you count up the secular structure, the solvent accessibility, in fact you lose the signal. Still these things are related. Okay, that's one. But you know, in some region here, the signal stays, let's call it good. This is, I predict for one side the signal structure and solvent accessibility, for the other one I look it up. That's what you get. Blue is, I predict it for both. How can that be higher? Yeah? Well, our prediction is flawed, but at least it's consistent. Is that good or bad? Is that a random signal? The prediction? No. Prediction follows. But assume, assume that we would have real, let's call it, let's distinguish between. Um, in some sense, let's call it white noise versus systematic mistake. So if that would be a random mistake, could I learn from the correlation? Mind you, that the pairs that I'm looking at are things that have the same 3D structure. So in my image, I want to, in my, my graph here, I want to be high. Ideally, I, I find a description uh, that stays at 100% here. So this is higher. How can I establish this as meaningful? Do I need to do anything to establish that meaningful? Well, you have to show that just because they're predicted to be similar, they're, uh, they really have to be similar. So, just because the set... No, they are. They are they similar. Are, okay. So, the, so my, my, my set here underneath is a set of proteins that have similar structure. Yeah, well, it's, it's just the, the classification into families is Done according to predictions. So. No. No. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, I, I was very, very fast, and I'm presenting. I don't know how many pa papers I presented to you in the last um, 152 slides. Uh, what I just presented here are three papers. Um, but what I have underneath is scop, for instance. So I take scop families, scop superfamilies, all of those. And I ask, for all the pairs that are classified as similar family, superfamily fold in SCOP, what is the 1D similarity between those? By three different, let's call it methods. So that I showed. So the classification is not done by the prediction. That in fact is the axis here. The fraction for which this makes them, or the, the fraction of agreement between the one do strings between a pair of proteins for which I know by some cutoff they're classified according to, to being structurally similar. Family, superfamily, fold. Take from Scop, Karth. At that point, when Darius did that work, it was also Dali, another 3D alignment method. That briefly talked about, yeah? But why is the observed, observed they're not? If they are really similar, why? I don't, I don't he, he says uh, because the predictions make mistakes, and these mistakes are correlated. That's but what, he, uh, what is the observed then? What do you mean? That is the, the, the red curve is observed, observed. But if when you say that they are really similar, that should be. That was my first statement. In fact, so for objects that have the same three-dimensional structure, we have a difference. We have actually a remarkable difference in terms of the secondary structure. That's a fact. That's the, so I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, maybe I should not have given that slide. Uh, the, there's gonna be, let me just warn you, and you know, you're gonna lose your head anyway. I'm gonna shoot you dead anyway. Uh, there's a couple of more of these slides that are all very, very, very heavy. So statement number one here is just, I should have shown you only the red slide, which is a very surprising statement. For all the proteins that I look at here, they all have the same 3D structure, but the 1D string is not staying, independent of the sequence similarity, staying at the value closer to 100% is the first surprise. Entirely un, uh, unexpected. 
when, when first this type of information was displayed in the 90s, uh, that was not even believed. Yeah? On the other hand, um, even though the sequence identity can get close to 0%, we still have a, some, some kind of signal there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's still surprising. We, again, mind you, the 3D structures are, by some criterion, uh, again, this has been played on, on different databases, considered to be identical. And what is aligned here, or what is compared here, are the, two, the 1D strings of the regions that are considered to be structurally identical. We're not having the, do uh, it's no longer on the white part, we're not having a domain issue here. It's really domains. Okay, so that is the answer to that. You, you still had a point. I want to, to come back to your last question. I think you also need for the predicted predicted, you need a set of not similar families, like uh, sequences from different families, in order to get meaningful separation. So, you, in fact, I believe I take that, you said something that sort of uh, may imply that as well. Uh, you don't trust me before I come up with a method that actually uses it in some sense, which in fact would be have distinguished true from false would be one way of establishing a method, right? Well, I wanted to say uh, about, about the blue curve, so... Um, Ble blue and red. Methods that predict two dimensional or the, the second, second structure, um, they usually get the, the main part of, um, of the secondary structure right, but don't get the ends um, as well, um, which means that, um, well, if we get all the ends wrong, then we kind of get them right. What I want to say is that um, our predictions overlap better with other predictions than with uh, the observed. So now we have a case where I believe that I understand you, um, because I believe that I have a similar belief in, in uh, explaining these results. But we are now in the realm of what typically is called religion. Uh, this is no longer science, but it appears as if the, I've paraphrased, you didn't say that, I sort of said that myself, the secondary structure or the 1D predictions correlate in a meaningful way. Meaning that where the secondary structure is well defined, for instance the core, is where the prediction method gets it right, where it's not well defined. In fact, those are not the 3D similarities. That varies really between the 3D structure. And that is where the secondary structure prediction method makes a mistake. So the prediction method makes a mistake where things can move. And that, in fact, produces is a better reproduction of reality. It's a remarkable finding, though. Uh, I still owe you the method. The method, in fact, takes the prediction of solvent accessibility and secondary structure and puts it in, into, here, here uh, you see the entire new alphabet. So instead of having 20 amino acids, you now have 20 times 3 times 2, so 120. So you have a new alphabet of 120 letters, and you simply do a dynamic programming on these 120 letters. The Threading, you have said many times, you have two times now used the terminology of threading. Threading, fitness of sequence for function is, is another word of that. Essentially the idea is you take a 3D structure, you thread your sequence into that 3D structure and you learn from the, sequence, from the 3D structure what can fit. Because if two residues on that 3D structure would come together that are positively charged, you believe this wouldn't work. So your potential somehow would say bad position, move on. Fitness of sequence for structure, threading uh, is the process that the word comes from Janet Thornton, um, David Jones, uh, to thread the, the protein through that 3D structure. So essentially you compare a protein to 3D structures and you look at a potential and then you try to predict similarities that are not easily recognizable from sequence alone. In this particular case here, what we do is we, we in fact take the 3D structure, uh, we translate it to a 1D projection, we take the sequence, predict 3D stru uh, 1D structure, and then we compare these two things in a regular dynamic programming. That's the beauty of the method. You map 
your problem to something that you already solve. And again, initially, you, you, when, I, when the lecture started today, you gave this answer. What I really meant is a, a more the dihedral di 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 angle view may have more. Now, does this help? And again, from Darius. Uh, so now here, uh, no, this is still the, the one that I showed you before. This is now, that's the method, method from Darius. False positives, true positives, psi blast. Uh, those were, at the time, methods that, comp that were one, the CASP. Uh, they use, those are threading, what you would call threading methods, FUG, 3 PSSM, uh, and you see that throughout, in fact, this, you call it agape, uh, method, in fact, did perform quite well. So you clearly identify things in the context of identifying things that you don't want to find. Wherever you go, you clearly do better than Cyblast, or did in those days better than Cyblast. Uh, by the way, here he, he worked out a, form, a, a way to sort of predict the E value or the distribution. And what you see here is essentially the true uh, distribution and the predicted distribution. And I like this slide. So the uh, true is the, the dots, and the prediction is this, this nice curve here. Uh, I have never, I've never done any, any work where, where something was that close to a real fit. Uh, this is usually not computational biology. This is just an exceptional case. Uh, this helped him very much to, to get the E-value right and to make that method here work very well. We are at the end. On Thursday, somehow I did the same mistake here. Uh, Sudden, sudden, something happened. So on, on Thursday we will talk about comparative modeling. Thanks for your attention.